testing one, two, three. Definitely save each time, and I'll later post it up later. later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I said for, for 30 years they were hung over it. Well, it's good to see everyone this morning in our class. And uh, Dennis told me I felt that sermon, the last sermon. I guess I got a little bit enthusiastic, <laughs> and I do love that text. But I also love the fact, and of course, I'm a little bit uh, aware of my own grandchildren, power in the blood, and um, and all that, those, everyone that has blood and being white as snow and garments and all that kind of stuff, well, the kids were all singing. All four of my, my grandkids were, were singing. I know even Luca, he was going right in with the rest of them. That was, that was real sweet. Uh, we are continuing our discussion of the book of Isaiah, and we're going to be finishing up in the latter part of the 40th chapter in our lesson today. And I'm um, hoping to get through uh, chapter 43 and maybe get 44 through 48 next week. We'll see how, how that goes because uh, there is a lot to cover, especially uh, when you get into, um, into the, uh, the text of, of uh, chapter 40, um, uh, 42 and the uh, first four verses of that with regard to the messianic prophecy that is there, but it's also something I think that just by doing some reading we can, can get the most of it. Not a whole lot of discussion is needed, but as always we'll have a few review questions before we begin. Uh, if you will bow with me, we'll have a word of prayer to start our time together. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we're here today, so grateful that you give us the opportunity to worship you and to praise your great and glorious name. Give thanks for all that you have done for us, how wondrous and powerful and merciful and great you are. We pray, dear Father, we would always be mindful of those things and always um, be without hesitation telling others about you and your son Jesus who died for us. We're thankful for the life that he lived, the death that he died, his resurrection from the dead. We realize that all the spiritual blessings that you bestow upon us come through him in this covenant, in this time, and we're so thankful that we have the hope of eternity in your presence because of what Jesus did while on earth. We ask that you help us to live righteously always, that we might serve you acceptably. We ask for forgiveness and your mercy and care for us when we falter from time to time. Dear Father, we are so grateful for this day and so excited about the opportunity we have to study together, to worship you this day, and we pray, dear Father, that everything we do will be into your glory. We ask it in your son's precious name. Amen. All right. Uh, now, we're at a dividing point in our study, as we mentioned. The 40th chapter begins the second half of the study, which deals with Babylon. But it's hard to go back to review questions in that section when we're just starting it. So I have just a few I want to note, some different ones from last week. And then we'll probably, as we get into the, the latter chapters and the next lessons, we won't be going back as far to the front. We'll, we'll probably be starting with chapter 40 and going on. But just remind me which king it was who came to the fortified uh, cities of Judah and took them and, and surrounded Jerusalem. What was his name? Yes. Sennacherib. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I repeated that question. Uh, so, yeah. Um, 
so the king was Sennacherib. The, the emissary of the king was, was the Rabshakeh. So, um, so those are the two differences. Um, okay, with regard to his claim in chapter 36 and verse 10 of the text, I'll let you make sure you're there, Isaiah 36, 10. Who did he claim had sent him to destroy the land? A pretty good military tactic, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's claiming, okay, you're, you're saying you're serving the Lord, but the Lord's the one that sent me. And uh, I, you see that today, I think, quite a bit as well. Uh, not necessarily a direct reference to God, but basically um, what is in effect a kind of a, a gaslighting uh, that is done when an individual is, is claiming that, hey, uh, who you're claiming is on your side is actually on our side. And the one who is right and the one who is wondrous, he's actually on my side. The one that belongs to you actually belongs to me. And uh, that's one of the things that the king did. Third question, when Sennacherib surrounded Jerusalem and lay to lay siege to the city, what ultimately happened? That's re referred to in chapter 37 in verses 36 and 37. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, that's, so the Lord is the one that defeated the king. Uh, those um, troops that were there, the one, the soldiers, 185,000 men of Assyria uh, were, were slain in one night. And the other notable thing about that is not only was he successful, but as he had prophesied, Sennacherib went back to Assyria, uh, and he did not return again in his lifetime. So that gets us those three things, but there's one other point that I wanted to make from chapter 38. After all of this happened, Hezekiah uh, grew sick, uh, even to death. He was told by Isaiah to put his affairs in order because he was going to die. What did um, the king do at that occasion, and what was the result of it? Okay, so... Uh, that's a good lesson for us. Uh, it was God's will. In other words, God was not going to intervene in his life, but because he made that petition, God determined, okay, yes, I will give you 15 more years. Now, brethren, we, we don't have the same benefit with regard to our own lives of, of having that, that answer that Hezekiah received and that was recorded for us in Scripture. But what we do have is the same providential care of God. And we actually talked a bit about providence. Do not doubt that if it is God's will to further your life or to maintain your life or to make a decision to do something different for you or to answer a petition that he can't do it or he won't. If he desires to do it, he'll grant it. And this is just one of those wonderful examples of that. Because he wept bitterly, because he desired more time, because he was a righteous king, because of what he had done, God said, okay, uh, you get 15 more years. And then he gave him a sign, uh, the sign that the sun would, would retreat 10 degrees on the, on the um, um, sundial of Ahaz, uh, which it did. And, and that was a sign to Hezekiah he would live further. So that's a, that's a neat thing for us to contemplate. Okay, any questions or comments about what we've covered up to this point in time? All right, so we uh, spent some time in the first, um, first uh, few verses of, of the text. We talked about uh, how God used Isaiah to comfort a, a generation of Israel after he, he died. Uh, we talked about in, in that section of Scripture uh, uh, the idea of, of the recurring theme uh, that God made in challenging idols and such, and and it serves as kind of a prologue offering comfort and assurance to God's people. Uh, what we got to, basically, was down to verse 9 of the text. And, and here in verse 9, and actually going through the rest of the chapter, uh, there are basically verses that show just how great it, God is and how preeminent it is. How does that line up with the, with the reading uh, that we have? So I might get a little bit uh, enthusiastic about these readings as well. I just want to remind you of some things. It's interesting, the parallels that are made, because I, I actually quoted Job again. But instead of the 40, 42nd chapter, I, I want you to remember in Job 38 in verses 1 through 4, 
where the Lord answered Job when Job asked those questions about why. He answered him out of a whirlwind. And God said to Job, he said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? You're ignorant, in other words. You're talking when you shouldn't be talking, when you should be listening. And he said, he said, prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you and you'll answer me. And then the first question he asked, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You tell me if you have understanding. Well, he was nowhere. He didn't exist yet when all of those things happened. So he couldn't answer God in that regard. So just contemplate that just for a moment. We are talking about the Almighty God, and the questioning of God goes on today. It is so prevalent in our society especially. And that question should answer it. Well, where were you when I started it all? You tell me that. And then we can go on beyond it. And the answer was, you weren't here. You don't have that knowledge. You don't have that self-existence. You don't have that eternal nature. And so it's just a wonderful thing. But notice uh, in Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm going to read just a few verses. I'll tell you which verses, but we'll just read through these to make the point. Verse 9, so first of all. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Okay? The divine demonstration. Verse 12 of the text. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? We're talking about seas, we're talking about lakes, we're talking about rivers, we're talking about the waters of the earth. He's held them in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the, balance, the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance, or, or weighed them in, uh, in scales and the hills in a balance. Consider that. I, that. That's just a wonderful thing. One of the things that, that science has used, so-called science, I w let me rephrase that because science is good, but, but um, evolutionary theories and, and, and the, the influences that have come in the last couple of centuries uh, is, is to, to note just the immensity of the universe and to use that immensity to, to come up with theories concerning life on other planets, which is an assured thing and a fact, even though we don't have any evidence of it, even at this point. Uh, and there are many who will go so far as to say, surely not only there is life, but there is intelligent life, because I, I just came across, I think they said that within the solar system, there's like 5,000 exoplanets, which mean rocky planets that exist. I just read that yesterday, if I read it correctly. Uh, in other words, planets that are similar to Earth and that they're not gassy giants. Uh, they have rock and they have um, uh, something that may be akin to. Did you hear that, that on Mars the rover uh, ran over some rocks that broke in half and sulfur was there? Okay, well, it's all right for there to be some sulfates. They found some. This is pure sulfur. Where did it come from? What does that mean about life and the possibility of life? So those kinds of things all, all come up, and, and they're all a part of it. But we've got an eternal being who holds... Uh, and measures heaven with a span. And so this is a this is an instrument of measure. It's a it's a length, a rod that's that's a particular length that is used in, in ancient calculations to say how big it is. The universe is quote infinite, and we we've we've used the Hubble telescope finally in the 21st century to, to go back almost to the beginning. Can't get to the beginning, God can. And it's easy for him. It just shows you just how great he is. Verses 15 through 18 of the text. Behold, the nations, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. They're counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its be sufficient for a burnt offering. All the nations before him are as nothing. They're counted by him as less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? What? likeness will you compare to him i just love that passage that's a good one verses 15 through 18 verses 22 and 23 it is he who sits above the circle of the earth its inhabitants they're like grasshoppers who stretches out the heaven like a curtain he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in he brings the princes to nothing he makes the judges of the earth useless Verse 25, to whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? 
And then finally, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known? <laughs> Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. To those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fail, or excuse me, utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now that's a, that's a passage you're familiar with, aren't you? These are wondrous, wondrous expressions of how great and majestic God is. Now, the final one is a little bit different than the others, and we'll make this note, and you can uh, offer any thoughts that you want to offer. But, but in verse 31 of the text, after he extols God's name so much, he says, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and I love this phrase, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Um, I had Luca... Uh, taking him to my house, I guess it was uh, Friday night, was it Friday afternoon, where we were going over there. And we hadn't got on the road hardly at all. And um, it was just as we were getting onto the, the highway to, to make our way to I-35 and come home. But there was apparently behind this brush some water. And I don't know what kind of water bird it was, but it was a big one. And it was swooping in with the wide wings, just not even flapping, just gliding, and it went... It, it couldn't have been more than 50 feet from our car. And, and unfortunately, it was gone before Luca got to see it. But whoa, it just, it just shocked me just how glorious that was. And what a glorious sight that it was. And, and that is what I'm mindful of. Mount up with, with wings like eagles. You see the majesty of an eagle. Recognize just how glorious uh, it is as a creature of God. But... but that strength that is seen in their wings and their ability to maintain for hours this flight and often to, to ride the currents without even having to flap their wings and just this glory of, of these creatures, that's, that's what comes and accrues to us if we wait on the Lord. And, and so uh, all of these maj majesty, all these things he uses to indicate that because of who God is and because of, of what he is capable of, that those who belong to him, if they wait on him, they too will have that strength and they'll gain that victory. Again, on Thursdays we're studying uh, Revelation and, and I'm trying to emphasize to them that's the whole message of the book. Now we'll get into the particulars as time goes on, but the purpose of the book is to tell those suffering Christians, hey, don't worry, Christ has this, we win. We get the victory, and it's, a, it's just a wonderful thing for us to know. Okay, uh, so that's a lot of verses, a lot of things that I read there at that time, but uh, before we get into the 41st chapter, is there anything that you want to add about the 40th chapter, anything that you want to address uh, for our consideration this morning? Okay, all right, then if you get to chapter 41, notice again, if you do have your materials that we're basically covering uh, the... Um, the summaries, we're, we're passing up the outline, those, that's for your consideration. We'll get into the questions when we have time. But, but again, because of a want of time, we'll probably only get through the next couple today. Um, but in chapter 41, we are again talking about God's greatness. And it's illustrated here by his challenge to the nation. So we've already indicated that the nations are nothing, all of these things uh, uh, in contrast, comparison to him. So we look at the mighty things of this earth and we look at the empires and we look at the nations and we're worried about China and we're worried about Russia and all these kinds of things mean nothing to God. Which tells you where your allegiance should ultimately be. Our allegiance, although we are perhaps faithful citizens, we're interested in the affairs of the United States of America, our ultimate allegiance is to God because God is the one who is victorious. God is the one who has the power. We give our allegiance to him, and especially if we give our allegiance to him as a nation, then we would not have to worry about the other powers and the other individuals that, that would do us harm. But notice what it said in Isaiah 41, first couple of verses, no, let's go from verse 2 to verse 4. He says in verse 2 of Isaiah 41, Who raised up one from the east? Who in righteousness called him to his feet? Who gave the nations before him and made him rule over kings? Who gave them as the dust to his sword and driven stubble to his bow? Who pursued them and passed safely by the way that he had not gone with his feet? 
Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and the last, I am he. Okay, so keep in consideration what we've studied up in the first 39 chapters. Assyria is the world empire at that particular time. This, the, the sorrow that came upon many nations, the judgments upon many nations because of the evil that was present in the land... But understand that the tool that was used by God to judge the nations at that time was the world empire of Assyria. Now, Assyria was brought low too, wasn't she? Who did that? God did. God's the one who has the control of all of these things. And the same thing is true with regard to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar was used uh, to bring Judah to its knees, to take them into captivity, to chastise them by God. But God judged Babylon as well. And ultimately gives the assurance that God's people will never be forsaken, though they may be chastised, because the time will come when God will establish his own kingdom, which will endure forever. And we'll get into that in chapter 42 in just a moment. But there are two passages, especially with this last phrase. Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I am the Lord. I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. And those come to mind because they're so similar The first one is with regard to the nations, what is said in Acts 17. We've addressed it somewhat already. But where the Apostle Paul says that in verse 26 of Acts 17, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. He has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. We've already read that, but God's the one to control the nations. And then the second one, which I think is almost an exact repetition of verse 4 of the text is in Revelation 1 and verse 8. It is stated twice in that text, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I don't know if you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, there are individuals who contend that this first uh, declaration of this has reference to Jehovah God, not Jesus. The latter one The second one would have reference to Jesus because Jesus is the one speaking. But that I and the Alpha and the Omega, the reason why is because it says the Almighty and that that term the Almighty is not used of Jesus in the book of Revelation. It is certainly one that uh, is in other places and it's certainly appropriate to use it for him. But maybe that has reference to God. Whether it's God or the Son, the Father or the Son, it is God that is referred to here. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the the self-existent one, the first and the last. We need to give God, God the glory. But, continuing on, anybody question, have any questions up to about verse, um, let's see, I'm going to go to verse 23 next in the text of chapter 41. Anything we need to cover? Any other readings? Again, we're, we're trying to make a look at passages which make each point that is made in the summary, so we may skip over some things. If we do, uh, I'll try to explain anything or ask someone else who may have a better understanding of it than me if there's something that you don't recognize, you don't understand. Chapter 41, now let's drop down to verse 23. The second point that he makes concerning that chapter is his challenge to those who trust in idols uh, to do as he did. Okay? So what is characteristic of God? God says something's going to happen and something happens. Okay? That's a, that's a big characteristic of God. He announced his plans and he brought his plans to pass. So he, he has promised that. He promised that, of course, in Genesis, the 12th chapter. Um, we, can, we can talk about all the promises made with regard to the seed promises, uh, but we also can, can, can reference other promises that God has made from the, from the first chapters of Genesis um, and, um, and the fulfillment of, of those promises. And other promises are made to Moses and to Joshua and to the people of Israel. But notice the contrast, verse 23 and 24. This is his challenge to those who are seeking after idols. It's kind of a hard thing to know when he's talking about the idol himself and those who proclaim the idols. And there's a reason for this, and that is because the one who proclaim their fidelity and faithfulness to the idols, they are the ones who are the idols. In other words, they are the ones that have enacted these idols in their own their own. Uh, imagination. So, in effect, if he's talking to Baal, you, you think about this. He's, he talks, uh, say Elijah talks to the prophets of Baal 
in 1 Kings chapter 18. And in that 18th chapter, it's a great contest. And Elijah is saying, you go to Baal and you talk to Baal. The only way that Baal would have any ability is if the prophets had the ability because Baal didn't exist. Okay, so they would have to speak Baal into existence or they would have to speak action into existence or else it's not going to happen and certainly it did not happen and he made fun of them about it but the fact is Baal was not there where, Je where Jehovah was. Notice in verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing. Your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. If you want a, a, a very well-rounded denunciation of idolatry, that's it. That's something to keep in mind. Notice verses 26 through 29. Who has declared from the beginning that we may know and former times that we may say he is righteous? Surely there is no one who shows. Surely there is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. So you see the showing, the declaring, that would be maybe the prophets. Or maybe it has reference to the idols, but specifically the idol there, who hears your words. The first time I said to Zion, verse 27, look, there they are, and I will give to Jerusalem one who brings good tidings. I looked, and there was no man. I looked among them. There was no counselor who, when I asked of them, could answer a word. That's, that's it. That's the idolatry. They didn't know what was going to happen, did they? They couldn't, couldn't answer him because they were impotent and they were limited in their knowledge. That's one of the reasons why so many alliances were made to prevent the events to happen because they, they were not trusting in God and his power. But he says in verse 29, they're all worthless. Their works are nothing. Their molded images are wind and confusion. And so there is a, again, those are good passages to look at if you have any questions about why God was displeased with idolatry. It's unfaithfulness to him. They're supposed to be looking to him. All the evidence is there as to why they should look to him, but here they're going to these things they make themselves. They can't do anything for them. And the evidence is there. It cannot do anything for them. No one can answer. No one can tell me. No one has the, the truth about this unless he is listening to me and what I say. That's what Jehovah said to them. And it's just a beautiful passage of Scripture. Again, I'm getting enthusiastic on it. Maybe it's just an enthusiastic day. Okay, so that's the 41st chapter, that I, the things I wanted to cover in it. Anybody have anything else that they want to share with us from chapter 41? Okay, that gets us then into the 42nd chapter. And there is an important messianic prophecy, one that you'll be familiar with in chapter 42 and verses 1 through 4 of the text. So listen to these words. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, this is Jehovah God continuing his discourse, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He'll not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his law. Now this passage is again an emphasis concerning the comfort that God would share and what's going to happen, God's plans being fulfilled in the new covenant in the man Jesus Christ. And it's obvious that that is the case. We've been studying that quite a bit, uh, no doubt. And, and, and again, we've talked a lot about this, the Messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah. But this has a direct fulfillment. In other words, the language is exact in Matthew chapter 12 in verse 14. Matthew quoted the Septuagint. So let me give you the full, uh, the full context here. It's basically the same text except for one exception. Matthew 12, verse 14, going through verse 21. On this occasion, Pharisees went out and they plotted against Jesus, how they might destroy him. So when Jesus knew it, uh, he withdrew from there and the great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. But he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying this. And then he goes to Isaiah 41. Now notice the, the, the familiarity of this. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved son, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. 
He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. And so uh, there is uh, a word-for-word fulfillment that Matthew is saying this is the one. Now, some may see a slightly different variant. Dennis actually brought this up last Wednesday. What would be the reason for the variation? In verse uh, 4 of of chapter uh, uh, 42 here, it says uh, that he will not fail or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. But at the end of this prophecy, it says his name, in his name, Gentiles will trust the earth, Gentiles. So it's very, very... Um, similar thoughts, the same teaching is given here, but different words. So why is there a different word? Real simple. See if you go to Google, because I Googled it to make sure that the same thing was true. What is that? What did Matthew uh, quote there? Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay? So we have in our Old Testaments that we, we have Masoretic text that is followed and uh, it has some variants from the Greek text that Jesus and his disciples typically quoted from. There's no loss of truth or, or misunderstanding with regard to this. It's simply a, a slight variant that happened from time to time. But we know that, that, that it is um, a valid uh, a translation, a valid fulfillment of the prophecy, and a valid translation of uh, of what is said because Matthew spoke by the inspiration of the Spirit. So it should not cause us any, any problems at all on this occasion. There are a number of prophecies where some slight differences change, but do keep that in mind primarily. One of the reasons for that, primary reasons, is because of the speaking from the Septuagint, the Greek translation. It would be like them speaking in the, in the Hebrew back in, in, uh, in the uh, uh, years preceding Jesus' coming and and, and uh, the old law, and then me having an English translation that I quote from at this point in time, and them trying to get that back and match the Greek up or match the English up or whatever the case may be. It just, uh, it, uh, it sometimes can lead to some slight, slight variations, and that's what is the case here. But you ought, it's obvious it is a direct quotation, which is another evidence that Jesus Christ is the one, the accepted by God. Uh, there are a number of other New Testament passages, in fact, many of them, which reveal um, some of the other aspects of this. Remember in Matthew 3 at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son, Matthew 3, 17. Or, or we talked about this last week in Matthew 17 and verse 5, the same statement being made at the transfiguration of Jesus. This is my beloved son. And then he says, hear him. He's the one that you are to listen to. And then the other thing that I wanted to notice is the statement made in Isaiah chapter 4. He said, I have put my spirit upon him. I have put my spirit upon him because it is an interesting thing. There is another passage of scripture in Luke 4, Luke 4 and 16, where Jesus proclaimed that God's spirit had been put upon him. Specifically using those words, we're told that he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. This is Luke 4, 16. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and where he read from is Isaiah 61, so we'll get to that later. But he delivered unto them the book of Isaiah, Esaias, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind and set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. He gave all of them that were in the synagogue, the eyes of them were all fastened to him. He began to say to them, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. You just heard it. He put his spirit upon me. And that's exactly what happened, wasn't it? that the anointed of God, the one that God chose, was sent into the world to do his will. And we can look from his childhood through his ministry until his death on the cross that Jesus always did the will of his Father in heaven. One of the most wonderful things about the time spent in, uh, in the temple by Jesus at the age of 12 after his parents had returned and then they had to come back and get him. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you here? And he had been reasoning with uh, the, 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 uh, the scribes and the, and the learned men in the temple. And he said, 
when they asked him, why did you do such a thing? Can you imagine how upset and worried they were? A 12-year-old boy, and they had traveled a day's journey, thinking he was with the rest of the family, and turns out he didn't show up. Oh, no, we left him in Jerusalem. We had to go all the way back another day. It wasn't like he'd jump in the car. I did that once with Jeremiah. I mean, not with Jeremiah, Josh. He was, he was asleep on the pew, and we had people over at our, at our uh, house. And I thought Debbie took him. He thought I took him. And so he woke up by himself in a dark auditorium. Uh, uh, and and when, I, when I pulled back, you know, I called. It may, may have been the, the phone ringing that woke him up. I don't know. But I called, trying, hoping as a young child he could reach up there and get the phone. And I could tell him, everything's okay. I'm coming to get you. But when I got there and drove up 15 minutes later, you know, after we realized we didn't have him, uh, he had his face, tear-stained face in the window, you know, the, the middle window and just crying. And uh, I felt so bad about it. But can you imagine what, what, uh, what the, kid, the, the parents of Jesus felt like in regard to that? But what did he say? I must be about my father's business. I must be about, and that's what he did the entirety of his life. From the time he was 12 years old, time he was born, until, until the time he died, he, he did not his own will, but the will of his father. His father put his spirit upon him, gave him this, this purpose, this mission for him to accomplish in his life. And Jesus on the cross at Calvary, when he gave up the ghost, what did he say? It is finished. He had done it all. He had done all that needed to do. So, so it's just a wonderful expression. I love that passage. I love it from, from chapter, uh, you know, the, the indication of it here from the 42nd chapter, but also in chapter 61 as we'll, as we'll get to later in our study. Anybody have any comments or questions about uh, those first few verses, verses 1 through, 1 through 4, concerning that Messianic prophecy? Okay, all right. With a little bit of time left, let's go into chapter 42 and 43. Um, you will note that uh, uh, the next, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, let me go back to where I am. Direct prophecy, those passages. Okay, uh, we're still on this point. I just, I, I'm sorry about that. Looking at my notes, I kind of got confused for a second. So do want to note this one thing with regard to this prophecy, the prophecy itself, what it's about, that it would be a protection afforded by the Lord, and it would be uh, what we would refer to as an everlasting protection. It would not be a time when God's elect would not, be, would not be helped. And so that is dealt with in latter verses in chapter 42 and 43. We'll get into other things about, about that as we, as we get into the study. But notice this. God's people would not see or believe that the Lord would protect them. But in chapter 42 and verse 23... While it is that God had made this promise, the people, which is what led to the Babylonian captivity on the part of the Jews, people just didn't accept it. And remember what, what did Paul, or next to me, what did the Lord say about Isaiah concerning his prophecies? How long would he have to prophesy? Prophesy through his entire life, right? And he lived and died as a prophet. We, we've understood that. This is after his death, these things that he prophesied about. So... So at the time these things are happening, he's already dead. Wasn't dead when he wrote it. <laughs> he, said, he wrote it in the future, then he died, and now we're to the future, and now these things are happening, okay? So there is that that, uh, that we, we have here. But what would be the result of Isaiah's preaching? Not to us in our lesson, but with regard to the people that he was preaching to, the prophecies. Wouldn't do any good, would it? Because even though there could have been times when they could have repented and turned back to God, they wouldn't heed what Isaiah had to say until what he said was going to happen, happened. So tell them about this. Warn them about this. Give them exhortations. But it's not going to make any difference. <laughs> it's still going to happen because they're not going to listen to you. Well, notice what he said in chapter 42 and verse 23. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? He just wouldn't do it. Now, ultimately, again, Jews on, 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 uh, during the, the life of Jesus would listen, would they? This is his final promise of protection uh, as given there in, in Isaiah 42 and the first four verses. His kingdom is his protection. Okay, now we get to the next section concerning what is said in chapter 42 and 43, and that is 
his superiority over the nations, including Babylon. So we've already talked about that a little bit. The 39th chapter, the latter part of those verses say it. Um, and I, I'm almost finished with the time that we have together. But there are two passages that I wanted to read from Isaiah 43, um, just so that you can see it. The first one is verses 6 through 11. Reading through a lot of these verses, just to cover it quickly, but if you will, read with me. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it's truth. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand. I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall be there after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I love that. There is no Savior. Now drop down to verse 14. I do this sometimes. I accidentally get my, my text mixed up. I, I read from the New King James, but every once in a while in my software I go to, these saiths are not in the King James, uh, New King James, but they, so I must have moved it to the American Standard or some other. Uh, verse 14 of Isaiah 43, Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles. And the Chaldeans, whose cries in the ships, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. I did it. So you, you, you hear about the fall of, of uh, the Babylonian kings to the Medo-Persian Empire and Cyrus being beneficent to the people and letting them return to the land to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple and the walls of the city. It wasn't Cyrus that did that, was it? The Almighty God of Heaven they did that. They brought Babylon low. In fact, God the Father and His Son, as indicated in Isaiah 42, was, is, and always will be, as stated here in the text. Notice again, Isaiah 43 and verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. We owe Him everything. That's why Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is our Savior today, as indicated in Isaiah chapter 40. But it is, it was, it always has been, um, it always has been that, uh, that uh, God is our Savior. And you see it in the affairs of men. And I just wish that we could learn well the lesson so it's always on our mind and so it would impact every aspect of our lives. Just to note how powerful God is, how dependent we are on Him, and ultimately... Everything that happens is in accord with His will. And the way we get to heaven is to trust in Him because He alone is the Savior. All right, so I'm, I'm not finished preaching, but I've preached twice instead of preached and taught. I uh, appreciate very much your kind attention that you've given me today. Does anyone have any comments about chapters 40 through 43, which I, I do understand we, we covered rapidly? Uh, we have also chapters 44 through 48 that we're going to discuss next week and we'll reserve our, our time for an examination of those chapters and the questions okay well I have not fully prepared my notes you'll notice in chapter 44 and 45 it's the reassuring of the people of Israel is God's chosen as the Lord promises to deliver them through Cyrus so there is that specific reference as to what was going to come and that that deliverance would cause many to turn to him. It's in chapters 44 through 45. 45. And all of this goes into the idea that one true God uh, versus idols. And I didn't change my slides, didn't I? Okay, so the last point in, in that slide is the greatness of God described. And then the next one, in chapters 41 through 43, we talked about the greatness of God, continuing on from verse 9 of chapter 40. The challenge to Zion regarding idols not to fear, but to trust in Him instead. Messianic prophecy that would show God's care for Israel, found in chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. Those are the other passages that we alluded to in our study. And then God's power and superiority over the nations is seen. He is and always will be the Savior and benefactor of His people.
So there we go through a summary. That's what we talked about today. Comments, questions? If not, we'll dismiss the class at this time. All right, we've got just maybe a minute left or a minute and a half, but uh, that's all the material that I prepared. Don't want to get into chapter 44.